Constituent Factors Observed in Viral Diseases, Part 3 of 5. Pause text and illustrations for detailed study. Refer to the previously posted constituent factors observed in viral diseases, Parts 1 and 2. Illustration of Viral Reproduction. Giant-sized viruses utilize a structure resembling a multi-legged starfish, referred to as a stargate, that remains sealed on the viral surface to introduce viral DNA to infect host cells upon entry into the host cell. Each structural leg opens and viral DNA and associated proteins are released infecting the host. Giant viruses are known to infect amoebas as well as phytoplankton and are believed to be capable of infecting animal cells. Direct links between giant viruses and human disease have yet to be established. Illustration of virus reproduction in a protozoan. Certain viruses are also capable of converting normal host cells into malignant or cancerous cells. The viral DNA genes can integrate into the chromosomal DNA of the host cell, leading to cancer cell growth in this process of malignant transformation. Such viral oncogenesis occurs when a transforming cancer-causing gene becomes integrated in the DNA or RNA of the host genome and or the tumor virus genes alter the gene expression on pre-existing host cell genes. Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis B and C viruses, human immunodeficiency virus, human herpes virus 8, human papilloma virus, and human T-cell leukemia virus type 1 are currently known cancer-causing viruses. A T-cell is a lymphocyte responsible for cellular immunity, secreting cytokines, but no antibodies against invading antigens. Chain of infection illustration. Certain viruses specifically infect blood, liver, or respiratory host cells. Certain viruses even target bacteria. Infectious viruses can enter the body via mucosal membranes, such as the oral, respiratory, gastric, intestinal, and urinary tracts, as well as structures such as the linings of the eyelids and tissue covering the sclera of the eye. 
A vasopressor is a substance that stimulates muscular tissue contraction of the capillaries and arteries, causing blood vessel constriction, vasoconstriction, and a corresponding rise in blood pressure. Aldosterone is a hormone secreted by the adrenal gland, causing an increase of plasma volume, edema, and hypertension. Its secretion is stimulated by the hormone angiotensin II. This hormone results from the action of angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin resides principally in the lungs and other structures including blood vessels having the effect of a vasopressor, stimulant of aldosterone secretion, and a neurotransmitter. Its vasopressor function results in a rise in blood pressure, restricted blood flow, and diminished fluid loss in the kidneys. It has been observed that COVID-19 can affect the endovascular bloodstream, resulting in derangements of blood flow, resulting in diverse conditions, including stroke, necessitating use of blood thinners, as well as inadequate local circulation, affecting the digits, which can lead to cell death and amputation. COVID-19 is believed to enter the body by the respiratory airways, adhering to the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptors in the nasal passage and lungs. These receptors are also present in the gastrointestinal tract, heart, kidneys, and liver. TMPRSS2 is the protease enzyme, catalyzing entry of the infectious virus into the host cell. SARS-CoV-2 utilizes the coronavirus SARS-CoV angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor for whole cell entry in the presence of the TMPRSS2 enzyme for the priming of the aforementioned S protein of COVID-19, facilitating viral entry to and infection of a novel host. The spike protein on the viral surface binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor resulting in viral entry and infection of the target host cell. The SARS-CoV-2 spike protein binds itself to host cells. Angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 is an element in the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway critical to the regulation of blood pressure, inflammation, and wound healing. This regulation of these elements is causative of the complications increasing the morbidity and mortality of COVID-19, discussed later in this presentation. Angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 is capable of mitigating the effects of angiotensin 2-mediated cell injury. Injury occurs should the availability of angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 become too low, resulting in inflammation, cell death, as well as organ failure, especially in the heart and lungs. This is because of decreased angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 due to high levels of virus binding, resulting in insufficient angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 breakdown of this enzyme which drives the lung injury and associated damage seen in COVID-19. In the presence of abnormally high angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 activity, molecular interactions amongst amino acids in SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins and angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 occur within prion-like domains of one or both. Evolution by natural selection may have been the driving force for the virus to adapt enabling its spike proteins to match the conformational shape-shifting ability of the host organism's angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptor. This enhances the spike's affinity for binding to the host angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptor, providing for the high contagion and transmissibility potential of COVID-19. The ability of proteins to undergo functional conformational change was previously discussed in the context of prion-like protein structure, folding properties. Prion-like proteins are not prions by definition, since the roles each are believed to play in human disease are quite distinct. The two main modes of coronavirus transmission are via expelled airborne visible infectious droplets 
and expired aerosolized particles respectively, measuring about one-third and one-hundredth the size of a human hair. The principal source of COVID-19 spread is believed to be via the larger droplet particles expelled when infected individuals breathe and speak. The droplets quickly settle and are less likely to accumulate in the air. The smaller aerosolized particles expelled during breathing, coughing, sneezing, or speaking may persist in the air for a longer period of time, up to three hours. The louder a person speaks, the more expiratory aerosols are released into the environment. Enclosed, poorly ventilated, densely populated spaces pose the greatest risk of virus transmission. Interior and outdoor spaces in the presence of ample airflow where individuals are wearing appropriate, properly fitting facial masks over their mouths and noses and are practicing commonly recommended social distancing of at least six feet between individuals provide for a much decreased chance of viral contamination, dissemination, and human infection. Proceed to part four of five.